We're pleased to have Joao Pino here. Joao is a professor at uh, University of McGill. She's done a lot of uh, great work in reinforcement learning, um, you know, Markov decision processes, partially observable models as well with applications to robotics, healthcare, and I guess more recently a lot of interesting stuff on dialogue systems. So she'll tell us about that. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here today. Great. Um, I have a slight nostalgia for the NIPS workshops of old where there was like 30 of us and we were all close by and I didn't have to speak through a microphone. Um, but still, I will try to do my best and keep this pretty casual and informal. Um, my goal today is to actually talk to you about some of the most recent research we've been doing on dialogue systems uh, using uh, neural architectures. Um, and when we conceive of dialogue systems, I have to say I've been working in this area of dialogue systems for several years. And in the early days, we were really focused on what I will call task-driven dialogue systems. So there was a very specific notion of what we were trying to accomplish. There was a structure that was inherent to the interaction. And so sometimes these came as what we called slot filling tasks, where we had to provide a sequence of information. And at the end, we could check there was a verifiable condition of whether we had satisfied the task or not, and that was easy to verify. And in recent years, following on the footsteps of several other researchers, um, in deep learning and supervised learning, we've been really trying to move out of this mold of dealing with only highly structured dialogue tasks and trying to deal with much more open-ended conversational chatbot type of systems. So that brings on a series of challenges. Um, and so I'll talk today about one of these challenges in particular, which is how do we go about evaluating the performance of these dialogue systems when we are in these settings where there's not a clearly defined task, and in particular, where we want to assess that in the context of an open vocabulary, unstructured conversation. And so I'll spend maybe the first third of the talk or so sort of setting out the lay of the land in terms of some of the recent generative models of conversation. I'm not really intending to be fully comprehensive there. I'm going to highlight mostly some of the work that's been done uh, within our own lab um, because of the short time span. But I'm doing that really to give you a taste of what are the types of models we're trying to evaluate. And most of my message today is really about how do we evaluate these dialogue systems and what we can do in terms of making it more automatic to do evaluation of dialogue systems. So I have sort of a somewhat provocative statement since this is in the context of an informal, informal workshop, right? We're really trying to go from this notion of a Turing test and turn that into an automated Turing test. So we can have a machine having a conversation with a human, and at the end of the conversation, we'd like to be able to sort of give a score of how plausible is it that this one of the two speakers was actually a human versus a machine. So getting sort of an automated scoring system for this. So for those of you who are not familiar with the task of generative dialogue modeling, let me give you an example. This is one of the data sets that we've been using. It's actually a data set of Twitter interactions. Most of the interactions are between two individuals. So person A will say something like, am I out of Twitter jail yet, testing? And person B will reply something, yeah, I posted bail. And the role of our generative system is to come up with a next utterance in this conversation. And so do that at a word level. So in this particular case, right, the, this is a ground truth response that we have in the data set. This isn't generated by a model. But our model should attempt to somehow come up with a plausible example. And the one in the data set reads, thanks, I'm a, I am a right chatter tweet box on Sundays. Same happened last Sunday, lol. And so you're starting to see that, that this can be quite an interesting task and challenging in that th there's not really a single ground truth answers, right? Probably some of you read the first two utterances in the conversation, came up with your own version of what the third statement should be, and it looked nothing like what the ground truth is, right? And so automatically evaluating the system becomes difficult when the space of possible generated sentences goes very far away from the data that we're actually observing. So conversation trajectories can take you in very, very far-fetched directions. Some of them are perfectly correct trajectories, but if we always force our system to only match the data that we have in our training data set, then it becomes very difficult 
um, to do. And we're losing, in fact, a lot of valuable information. So let's spend a few minutes looking at the classes of models which we are interested in using for generating these sentences. Most of the models we use, almost all of them, are based on recurrent neural network architectures. So we are assuming that the sequence which we're trying to model is actually at the word level. So on the input side, words are coming in one by one, and on the output side, words are coming out one by one. And so in some of our comparisons, we look at just a basic recurrent neural network, usually an LSTM architecture. But in some of our work, we've actually proposed some more complex models, which we feel are much better to model natural conversations. One of them, which we presented about a year ago, is the hierarchical encoder decoder model. So it's based on some of the encoder decoder architectures that are used in machine translation. This one has the particularity that on the encoder side, we actually have two levels of encoding. So one recurrent neural net is actually encoding the word by word sequence. And there's a level above that that encodes the sentence by sentence level. And so that presumably is able to capture some of the semantic content of the conversation up to a particular point in the conversation. And in this one model, we have a decoder that goes from that what we call the context hidden state or sort of the semantic state of the hierarchical encoder and outputs in a sequence word by word in terms of the response. And so this is the kind of model which we can trade with standard methods. And then I'm not going to spend a lot of time saying how we train it. I'm really focusing on the evaluation here. So when we develop these kinds of models, most of the metrics we use for evaluation are based, for example, on perplexity, right? We're interested in having good likelihood of our data. And so that's evaluated on the training set that we have. The perplexity is measured with respect to the answers that are provided in that training set. We sometimes also look at the error rates. So we look at what were the actual errors in the next sentence generated in my ground truth or my reference response. And we see what the machine generated. And we see what was the word error rate. And of course, we don't do that well. We can show that the models we're proposing, the hierarchical encoder decoder, does better than just a single RNN structure. We can show that it does better than an ingram model. But there's not really a sense that we're measuring how good it is in terms of um, generating interesting, diverse dialogue systems. And maybe the second model I'll, ma I'll mention, because it's quite useful to be able to distinguish between models, is a variant of the hierarchical encoder decoder that's actually the hierarchical latent variable encoder decoder. So one of the things we noticed when we were looking at samples of our models is that there isn't a lot of diversity in terms of the answers that are coming out of our system with the HRED model. We do well in terms of perplexity, but they're not really interesting answers. Um, and so. Um, some of the students involved in this propose this new model that actually incorporates latent variables on the decoder level. And these latent variables are trained with the data set. And so in a sense, they're, they're able to generate much more diverse, or we hope that they're able to generate more diverse answers. And if I give you some examples, we see that we're reaching that to some degree. So it, this may be a little bit small for some of you to see in the back. But in terms of the context, a person says, uh, why is it suddenly cold in Tallahassee today? And someone replies, uh, sitting on the deck in the sun, looking at Lake, Lake Travis and so on. And so we have three candidate response in this case, right? The VHRED model, this is the one with the latent um, variables. This one says the sun is shining. And the standard LSTM model, sort of single level model, says I know. And the HRED model um, responds something. Um, as you see, very short answers that are one way to get reasonably good perplexity. I'll give you another example just because this one is kind of fun. Um, the context says, Ahecht dann Artwood, it volgende. You'll have to excuse my Dutch. Um, and so in this case, right, someone's talking, in, not in English. Um, it, and it turns out that our model was not really trained for other languages, right? We were using the standard word to vec embeddings. Um, most of our Twitter data sets all in English. The VHRED model takes it upon itself to respond in some version of Dutch. I'll leave it to some colleagues to decide whether this is plausible. Um, the LSTM says, ha ha, something, something, something. And the HRED model, never to be left behind, answers something, 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 something. You see where I'm getting at in terms of problems of diversity. 
none of these answers are anywhere close to the ground truth reference response we have our system. So in terms of our evaluation metrics, perplexity and so on, we're not really getting any differentiation. Yet intuitively, it seems like the VH Red model is doing something a lot more interesting than the other two in many of these cases. And I could have pulled out a much longer list of examples, um, as is common in these kinds of generative models, right? I'll show you my samples, you show me your samples. We're, we have a sense that the samples we're getting with some of these models are better than the others, and we're a little bit frustrated because the methods we have to evaluate them are really not reflecting this. And so many of the times in these, developing these models, we actually turn to a user study. And we actually run the user study where we show individuals the context. And going back to my earlier example here, the three sentences are what we call the context of the conversation. And then we give the um, people doing the evaluation a few sets of candidate answers and we ask them to rank them or to express pairwise preferences between them. And what we get is human scores that look something like this. In this case, right, the last answer, did you tweet too much, seemed to get better scores out of our uh, participants than some of the other answers. None of them the more all too bad. Probably this uh, poor baby, hope you get to feeling better soon, was least um, preferred from the candidate answers. But quickly we realized that these user studies are slow, they're expensive, but they certainly are much better at giving us some useful discriminative information about our different models. And so what we have is a little bit of a dilemma, right? We have some automatic evaluation metrics, and I haven't described them in detail, but in, in addition to perplexity and likelihood, the one that we're looking at most of the time and that's been used most in the literature for doing evaluation of this are actually metrics that are based on other natural language tasks, in particular the machine translation task. They have a blue score that they're using that is very common, and this is one of the most standard automatic metric which people have been using for generative dialogue models. And we, in fact, find that the blue score, though it performs quite well on the translation task, is really a very poor measure for dialogue system. And so what we're aiming for is, in fact, a way to compare responses automatically. We would like to be able to feed in a context to our model. The model will spit out what we call the generated response, and we'll be able to compare the generated response with a reference response. And taken together, we should be able to obtain a score. And so these metrics such as blue and rouge and meteor and so on do this, but most of them do this by simply looking at number of words that overlap between the generated and the reference response. Most of them don't take into account the context in terms of coming up with that score. And they're really based on this word overlap metric, which I hope my earlier examples convince you were really not adequate to reflect the quality of responses in a dialogue system. And if we look at this objectively, we ran some user studies and we compared, right, what is the scores that human are getting for a particular generated response compared to the blue score. And if we do that for human versus blue score, the correlation is extremely poor. It's in fact uh, almost noise. If we look, on the other hand, at the correlation between the score that one human is giving versus the other human, this looks on the right side graph, this is very nice correlation. Right? And so the, the people agree on what's a good response. Person to person, we have good agreement. It's just that the metrics that we have for measuring that are inadequate. And I should be very clear, the blue metrics have been shown to correlate well to human judgment for the task of machine translation. It's not an overall criticism of blue. It's really a criticism of using blue to score dialogue generative systems. And so we've been working hard on coming up with an alternative scheme to doing that. Um, and our efforts in that direction have led us to develop a model, I'll call it a scoring machine, that is able to predict the human scores in terms of response quality. And that is able to eventually take into account the fact that suitable generative responses can be very rich and diverse and that this should be reflected in the score. To do that, we actually, um, even though we wanted to get away from doing a lot of user studies, we had to step back to achieve this goal. We had a two-stage user study. We used Amazon Mechanical Turk for doing this, um, using the Twitter conversation data set. In the first stage of the study, we actually asked workers to generate candidate responses. And the reason we did this, in this case, we would show them the context, very much like you saw them 
in the talk this morning, short context, two or three utterances of a conversation, sometimes up to eight or ten utterances. We call this the context. We would show them this, and we would ask them to generate the next response. And this is what we call the reference response. And the reason we do this is to make sure that the reference responses that we're using are based only on the context. We, of course, could have just you know, taken the last statement in the conversation, call that the reference response. But we presume when there's a conversation between two people, they may have a very large baggage in terms of interaction, history, and so on that comes into play. And so we wanted to sort of level the playing field. So we asked humans to generate the next statement in the conversation in the same conditions under which our generative models are operating. So that was the first phase. Um, in this case, um, we presented uh, several contexts, a thousand different contexts, and asked people to generate new responses for all of them. And then in the second part of the study, we actually ran these pairs, uh, this context through our generative, our trained generative response models, the HRED, the VHRED model, and then at the end we asked the humans to score the quality of the response. So for each context there was sort of four different examples that they had to score. One was from a standard LSTM model, HRED, VHRED, and one was the ground truth reference response. We collected all of this data, split it into training, validation, and test, and then we had to figure out what to ask of the humans doing the scoring. So in the second part of the study, we're asking them to score. And we had a lot of discussions within the research group about what we should be asking them. First, we wanted, of course, to ask them overall, how good is that response? But then we thought maybe we should add some more specific questions in terms of, is this a response that is on topic? Is this a response that is specific to the background? This was a way to eliminate some of these something, something, I don't know, short responses. Um, how much background is, information is required to answer that response? So we looked at these four questions and we actually couldn't decide between us whether to ask all four or just ask the first one, so we ran a pilot study, um, which I highly recommend if you're doing user studies, spend some time piloting your questions and figuring out what are the right ones. And after running that, what we saw is that the correlation between people in terms of the overall score was very high. And same with topicality. But the other two questions didn't really res generate consistent evaluations by the scores. So we canceled out the last two. Um, looking a little bit more at the top two, we actually saw that not only people were correlated on both of them, which was good, but the answer to the two of them was highly correlated. So when they scored highly on overall, they scored highly on topicality. So we just carded topicality also, and then we went forward with our study only asking for an overall ranking and score, which is a little bit more analogous to what's done in the Turing test. We trained up, once we had all this data, we trained up a model we call the ADAM model. The goal of this model is to actually automatically evaluate the system. And so in this case, we have a triple encoding. We're encoding the context, we're encoding the generated response, and we're encoding the reference response. And if you look a little bit more clearly at the score over here, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, that's the score that's in the box above the model. We're really looking at similarity between the context and the generated response, and then also similarity between the candidate response and the, gen so the, the ground truth response and the generated response. I should say that the encoding models for the context, the true response, and the model response, these are all pre-trained with much, much larger data sets. So we're using the human data just to, um, just to train the similarity matrix between these. And when we do that, we actually find that with this model, I'll just focus your attention on the box in the lower corner, this model is um, able to get quite good correlation in terms of the score that's coming out for a generated response in this machine compared to the score that humans are doing. If we look at, um, for example, Spearman correlation, it's quite good for the model, much, much, much better than what you're getting for other automated scoring metrics. And it's quite surprising, in fact, we, we didn't really expect to get uh, reasonably good score correlation from relatively little data, right? We looked at a thousand different contexts and we scored uh, four responses for each and that seemed to be enough data to train a much, much better scoring machine compared to um, these other metrics that we have. If you look at some of the scores, I've drawn a few examples here. Um, the examples that are presented here are all cases where the ADM score is actually higher than the blue or the rouge score. And so we see cases, the first one, someone says, I'd recommend build your own uh, HTPC. 
and so on. And the reference response is quite long. The reference response is no word overlap with the model re generated response, which is because it's brilliant. Um, and yet the human score judged that this is a perfectly suitable response. ADEM is able to judge that this is a perfectly good response. And of course, the blue and the rouge score don't do nearly as well because in this particular case, there's no word overlap between the reference response and the model response. And the final result I show you before closing is that one of the reasons we're interested in these automatic metrics is to be able to automatically evaluate new models, right? We're in the business of producing what we think are always better models and training algorithms for them. And so we wanted to look at the system level correlation. If I want to score overall a model, how well it's doing. And so in this case, we don't have a lot of data points yet, but we're seeing much, much better correlation with this ADM in terms of evaluating how good a new model might be compared to some of the previous metrics. And so this is quite encouraging. Um, I will finish with a quick summary. Um, Essentially, just to highlight the fact that I think there's some very interesting opportunities looking at generative models in the case of conversations, dialogue, and text. Most of the work we've seen on dialogue system is based in, sorry, in generative systems is based on uh, images and videos, and I think there's a very nice opportunities on the dialogue side that should be exploited. And I cannot finish without um, highlighting the fact that there, of course, a fantastic team of collaborators for this work. Some of the main collaborators are um, listed uh, below, um, and there's a big research team at McGill that's behind this also. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, I understand that the uh, metric at the end, of, uh, the p value is actually quite good. Uh, I'm curious if it's good enough, and where do you go from here if it's not? Yeah. It's, it depends good enough for what, right? Is it good enough to allow us to evaluate one model versus another model, I think the correlation results suggest that yes, we're getting very strong correlation. So if we want to use this to inform our development of models, it's quite good. Is it good enough in terms of, you know, we've solved this, you know, we have an automated version of the Turing test and any system going forth never has to uh, be evaluated in any other way? I, I, I wouldn't say that, right? This is a first demonstration that we can train an automatic system. It's trained from relatively little data. It's trained on a specific domain, right? These Twitter responses. One thing we haven't done, but we will definitely do in the next few months, is look at how well do the scoring that are trained on Twitter transfer to another domain. So we have other dialogue data sets, for example, uh, movie dialogues. We haven't tested yet whether we can use the same scores, the same weights of our scoring model on these other domains. Do we need to, to retrain this specifically for each domain? I presume maybe, maybe so. Thank you. So it seems like a lot of the kind of work into designing these metrics sort of goes towards creating natural dialogue. But then there's also the question of is the dialogue actually effective? So if, insofar as there's a goal, and perhaps in the interactions that you showed, it's not quite clear what, what the goal might be. But what are your thoughts about kind of more goal-driven dialogue systems and how some of these ideas might translate? Um, I think it's a, it's, it's a hard question. There's some fantastic work happening on the goal-directed dialogue side. And in some sense, um, there's people working on non-goal-driven chatbot type of agents and people working on goal dialogues, on goal-driven dialogues. And we talk to each other and we read each other's papers, but the models and the techniques are, at this stage are reasonably orthogonal. Um, simply because I think there's plenty to be done on each side. One of the things that I'm really interested in thinking about is how, what is the appropriate notion in the, of a goal that we can specify without requiring too much engineering? So one of my objectives to these goal-directed systems is they really need a testable condition for knowing whether you've satisfied the task or not. I don't know how to generalize this notion of you know, a testable condition for success. And I want to be in a space of dialogues where we don't require that. And so I don't know yet how to bridge that gap. Oh, but, but it seems like this notion of naturalness uh, in your work is, it seems actually more difficult than specifying uh, some notion of success. It is, but it's specified by the data, right? So I don't need to go and write a criteria that would, of course, be brittle and incomplete. Already just asking, figuring out which questions to ask 
w was a tough enough task. And what we found is that the, the one question we could reliably ask and get good inter-rater correlation was about the overall judgment. Anything more specific, right? Like, can you generate an uh, informative response? People didn't even agree about what that meant. So in terms of having a testable condition, uh, I didn't think we were there yet. Thank you. So my question is regarding uh, how do you compare user uh, response like you gathered the manual data set from users to manually type it. So is it like uh, common words which are present and also there may be some spelling mistakes like uh, I could see uh, the word Y is typed with so many Y letters. So uh, how exactly you calculate uh, uh, similarity between response and the computer generated response kind of? So, so in this case, there's two parts, right? There's the, the notion of how do we quantify the similarity between the scores, right? And in that case, we just look at the scores and we assume that the users are dealing however they can with the spelling mistakes and, you know, however intelligible the Twitter statements are. And so we're really just looking at the rankings from the two users. And so we, when we look at the kappa correlation, it's really just based on the ranking between the users. And same when we're looking at um, validating the scores that are coming out of our at a model versus the scores from the user, it's really just at the score level that we're looking at that. I had a follow-up uh, question to uh, Sergey's point. So I wonder if one way uh, to bridge between the kind of goal-oriented, let's see if we can book a flight to the kind of open-ended, can we generate natural dialogue is to have settings where um, the goal is kind of scoped to something like, um, am I helping you answer kind of being informative and answer questions for you? Suppose you're a tour guide or a tutor or something. And so still leaving the domain open, but kind of having still some sort of direction into a dialogue. I was wondering if you thought about that. We've thought a lot about that. And let me propose another surrogate to am I useful. The surrogate will be, um, did I purchase something? Right, so we have a lot of conversations with companies interested in making some of these dialogue systems, conversations towards eventually purchasing something, and then you have a very nice metric. How much money did they spend? Um, but in that case, you still need a human in the loop, whether it's to decide that at the end of the conversation it was satisfactorily resolved or they purchased something. You need the human in the loop during that interaction to do the evaluation. And, and without that, we don't yet have automated metrics. I mean, we could use simulated users. There's a lot of difficulty in getting good models of users um, that we can use for a broad set of tasks. Yeah, so, but, but I think you could use some of these techniques that uh, seem to work well to get at things. You had, um, I guess, metrics like informativeness, which I guess you threw out because people couldn't agree, but if that were more explicit, then maybe you could get agreement there. Yeah, and I think we did just a little bit of scratching the surface in terms of how to ask for the quality of the dialogue. And I think there's a lot more that could be done there in terms of phrasing that in a much richer way. All right, let's thank Joao again. Thank you.